بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد can everyone please pray salutation on the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم لك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم لك حميد مجيد اللهم تحنن على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما تحننت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم لك حميد مجيد so جزاكم الله هنا for this grand instruction um, I hope I hope I can live up to this, uh, what he's saying, and um, I hope I won't disappoint you today. This is a very, very important topic, but also a very sensitive topic, a topic that if you do not talk on it sensitively and sensibly, then can get me more than you into trouble. And the reason why I want to talk about this uh, particular subject was because uh, there seems to be a, um, uh, a dissonance, there seems to be two narratives. Uh, when we uh, Muslims, when we talk about Islam, okay, uh, we talk about Islam as a religion of peace. That's the narrative that we put forward. Okay, the narrative that non-Muslims see is completely different. Now, call it media spin, or call it whatever you want that the media is against us, it's Israeli politics, the West is against us. But the reality is that when we say Islam, jihad, beheading, cutting, Taliban, ISIS, all of these images are conjured up into the non-Muslim mind. I mean, um, there's, a, there's an exercise that, that I do um, with my students when I'm teaching them this particular um, lecture of, of a topic on ethics that I teach at university and I say to them that um, sp you know spit out what words come in your mind when the when the uh, what what thoughts come in your mind when the word Islam um, is mentioned and from and most of them are non-Muslims from there I'm just trying to kind of gauge what perceptions they have of Islam obviously in the beginning, they're a bit shy because I'm a Muslim, I'm their professor, uh, but I tell them, look, um, we're learning here. So then all the really interesting thing comes out. So it doesn't matter if we shout at the top of our, uh, of our lungs that Islam is a religion of peace, okay? But that message is not what is being received um, by the non-Muslims for whatever reasons. Uh, that, the reasons f uh, for the time being, I'm not interested in that. I'm just want to, I just want to address the dissonance, okay. Um, that's what dis you understand what dissonance means. The di the differences, okay. Um, and we also find that um, the topic of jihad has become kind of um, cliched. It's become uh, what we call watered down. The topic of jihad has also become like um, sugar coated, okay. Uh, many many years ago, when I used to still live in Oldham. I used to work in Ashworth High Security Hospital in Liverpool, which is a high security uh, prison. Uh, one day, one of the prison officers, um, security guards, called me and said, Imam, we need you to come and check a, um, a CD that's come in for one of the inmates. Um, we think that it might be extremist material. I said, OK. I went there, <coughs> and um, the CD had the title, This is my Jihad, okay, by Sheikh Habib Ali Jifri. Okay, this is my Jihad by Sheikh Habib Ali Jifri. Now, if you know Sheikh Habib Ali Jifri, he's a Sufi from Yemen. I, so, as soon as I saw this, I said, look, I can give you 100% guarantee there is nothing about jihad in here. Jihad is warfare. This is talking about spiritual, uh, spiritual struggle, um, that jihad is, is more of an in, in, inner struggle, etc., etc. The point that I'm trying to make is that when we do talk about jihad, um, a lot of the time it is sugar-coated and we talk about more about the, the spiritual side of jihad. <coughs> and there is a reason why. And the, uh, and the reason for that is that we don't want to let the non-Muslims know that Islam is actually a violent religion. Okay? Um, and so we, we uh, and this is happening, uh, this has been happening quite a lot. Um, if you know about the, the British Muslim landscape and the politics of the British Muslim landscapes um, in the UK, you will know that um, after the 2005 uh, bombing, uh, there was a new group that was, uh, uh, that was made, government initiative paid by the government for a while called the Radical Middle Way. Okay, the radical middle way, I mean, 
the devil is in the detail. They want to radically move away from the extreme and go to the, uh, 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 towards the middle. And now that group, uh, what they were basically tasked to do was bring in Sufi shuyukh from the Muslim world to give a different narrative of jihad as opposed to what the Salafi and the Hizb al-Tahrir narrative was. And that, that was the um, sole purpose of that. And they were quite successful to a certain extent. Okay, so the, you had a lot of Sufi shuyukh um, coming in and talking. So Sheikh Habib al Jifli was one of the person who was who was involved. But still, the question uh, still remains that Muslims are talking about um, either we talk talk about Islam as a religion of peace, or when we do talk about jihad, then we talk about jihad as a spiritual struggle. And nobody actually talks about the fact that the Prophet ﷺ actually did do jihad. Uh, when uh, non-Muslims ask us these things, then we kind of try to explain away. So one of the things that I've been trying to do is to um, answer those questions head on. And, and this is why this is called jihad. And it, it, it's, it's there as a religiously sanctioned institution of armed struggle. When I say religiously sanctioned, what that basically means is that it has justification in the religion. Point number one, not only justification in the religion, but the religion allows it. There might be some forms of violence which you can justify from the religion, but the religion may not allow it. Somebody asked, uh, asked me once in an open uh, uh, question session about um, why is there violence in the Quran? I said, well, there's violence in everything. You can, you can look for violence in Harry Potter if you're looking for it. Okay? But does that mean that it's sanctioned? So it's religiously justified, but not only religiously justified, but religiously permitted, okay? Institution of armed struggle. So when I say armed struggle, I basically, I'm not talking about jihad as tasawwuf, jihad as mujahada, jihad as spirit, uh, a spiritual struggle. That's a different context. Today, I'm not going to talk about that, okay? Um, I do accept that jihad al-akbar, the greater jihad, is jihad and nafs fighting with the nafs but that's not the topic today so what i will not be discussing today i will not be discussing the fiqh of jihad okay i will not be uh, i will not be discussing the fiqh of jihad the rules related to jihad because that really doesn't matter i will not be talking about the fadail of jihad okay the benefits of jihad and the virtue of jihad because i don't want anybody to misconstrue me and then go for jihad then i i get into trouble okay um, and then also what I will not be doing is I will not be talking about the modern cause of terrorism. Okay, that's a comp completely different subject on its own. Um, if we do have another session, maybe we can address that. But that, that will take another two hours just to discuss that. Okay, so those are the things that I will not be discussing today. What I will be, discuss uh, will be discussing today is how jihad... Uh, was seen during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how jihad is to be understood when we read the verses of the Quran. In the verses of the Quran, we have many verses where it basically says that, you know, seek, uh, um, hide in ambush. Um, and when the kuffar come, when the mushrikeen come, jump on them and kill them and beat them up. Okay. So how are we to understand those verses? Uh, what I will not be doing is I will not be discussing uh, uh, the, the later fuqaha or the later um, developments in the theory of jihad. Now one of the things that you have to understand is that when, when we talk about Islamic law, okay, or when we're talking about fiqh or when we say Islam, Islam is, although was revealed in the Quran originally during the time of the Prophet ﷺ and then expounded by the Prophet ﷺ in his hadith, but the bulk of Islamic law actually comes out from the working of the fuqaha, the working of the scholars. Okay? And therefore, what we're basically doing is we are working with 1400 years of scholarship. Okay? There are only 500 verses in the Quran directly related to Islamic law. And those out of 6,600 verses of the Quran, and out of those, only 80 of those are related, uh, 80 themes related to Islamic law. The bulk of it comes from practices of the Prophet ﷺ and the working out of the companions over the ages. And a lot of the times, the, uh, the fuqaha, the ulama, were products of their own time. 
Okay, so if there was a Muslim onslaught, uh, there, was, there was a non-Muslim onslaught and Muslims were being killed and there was an invasion like the Tatars came and invaded uh, the Muslims, the Fuqaha who directly got involved with that, who had something to lose, who had family and friends and students and teachers who, who lost their lives in that, will not be very sympathetic towards the Tatars. Okay, the fuqaha who were, uh, uh, you know what I mean by the fuqaha, the, the ulama, okay, ulama who deal with law. The ulama who were actually quite content with their life and they were going through a, a, a part uh, of their life where there was no fighting, it was very nice, they had all the funding to do the research, their take on life will be completely different. So what I'm basically saying is that we need to understand that they were also human beings, we need to contextualize that. The other thing that we need to understand is that we are living in a completely different world than the world that the Prophet ﷺ was living in. Do you accept that? That is the first premise. If you don't, if you don't understand that, then you will not understand um, the rules of jihad in the Qur'an. The first premise is that we are living in a completely different world than the world that the Prophet ﷺ lived socially, politically, economically, culturally, in every possible way that you can fathom, we are living in a completely um, different world. And therefore, what we can't do, what we can't do is to project our understanding of how we understand our lives today to project that on the Prophet ﷺ. Let me give you a very, very quick example of that. There has been a lot of hoo-ha recently and for many, many years over the age of Sayyidah Aisha. Now, was she nine years old when she got married to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Was she 19 or 18 uh, when she got married to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? There are uh, some ulama and some non-ulama and some really top ulama um, who actually argued that Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu ta'ala was 18 or 19 when she got married to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, sometimes these ulama feel a bit of inferiority complex in front of uh, the world that how can somebody get married to a nine-year-old and the reason why that is is because in this day and age if somebody says my daughter is 10 years old if somebody says he wants to get uh, married to my daughter I'll slap him one because we don't have that concept right but during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam people were getting married very young that is a historical fact not only during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu but all over the world people were getting mar uh, married very young. What we can do is project our understanding of how marital life and the relationship between a man and woman today be and to project that onto the Prophet Sallallahu If we project that onto the Prophet Sallallahu then we will start questioning his character. How can the Prophet Sallallahu get married to a minor? Doesn't that account to pedophilia? And all sorts of questions will come. So one of the first ways of reading history is what lens are you reading history with? Without the proper lens, if you try to understand it from your 21st century filters of, of let's say, modern Britain, you're going to come out with wrong answers, right? If you go to Bangladesh in the rural villages of Bangladesh and, and to marry a nine-year-old might be all right. So it's all, about how, it's all about perception. It's all about how we see things, okay? Now, I'm not advocating that you should go and marry a nine-year-old. I'm just giving an example of historical worldviews and how our worldviews are different from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The narrative that I will be presenting on, on jihad today is how I understood jihad from my wide reading of the subject and, ha, and how I, I believe that is how the majority of the ulama have understood this. Um, this narrative is not 100%, uh, uh, it's not 100% how everyone has understood it, okay? There's a very big school from the um, uh, Islamic schools of law, the Shafi'i fiqh, um, who disagrees with this understanding. Also, Muslim extremists and terrorists also disagree with this uh, reading. Also, far-right extremist groups such as Tommy Robinson and others will disagree with this reading. So this is an explanation of how to understand the Quran and Sunnah. It is not the explanation. 
because the Quran and Sunnah, you can read them in many ways. But what I believe what I'm going to be presenting is what the majority of the ulama um, understand how to read the Quran and Sunnah on this particular topic. There's a few components that we need to discuss um, when we talk about jihad. Uh, we all know what jihad means. Uh, jihad literally means to exert uh, we say in, 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 in Bengali, to exert oneself, to do, try your utmost best. Okay? Um, now, when we talk about jihad, three things are conjured in the mind of people. Spiritual struggle, religiously sanctioned institution of war, and vigilante warfare. When Muslims, 21st century Muslims are talking mainly about jihad, especially with their non-Muslim colleagues, this is what they're focusing on. When non-Muslim colleagues understand jihad, this is what they're focusing on. Nobody actually focuses on that because people want to shy away from the fact that Islam is a religion which advocates some form of violence. Okay. I will focus here today in the middle ground. In the middle, middle ground, we have got, again, so we have vigilante warfare, ISIS terrorism. We're not going to discuss those. In the middle ground here, can the sisters see this slide show? Yeah. In the middle ground, uh, we have two things. These are, these are Latin words, um, just ad bellum and just in bellum. These are fancy words for, this is, Justification for jihad, why do we need to fight jihad? What is the justification for that? Just in bellow is what are the ethics in jihad? So this is, you've justified it now, you're on the battlefield, okay? Um, what are the ethics? So the, w w I will not go into this. Muslim political dissident will not go into this, will not go into slavery. These, these are all subjects which come out of this. If anybody wants to ask me about these in the question and answer session, then I can possibly entertain that. Um, just in bellow basically will be that the Prophet Sallallahu says when you're on the battlefield, you are not allowed to kill a non-combatant, you are not allowed to kill a, 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 a child, you are not allowed to kill a, 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 a woman, you are not allowed to kill an old man, you are not allowed to poison wells, you are not allowed to burn down trees, you are not allowed to uh, kill anyone some, some other Muslims has given protection to. So all of those, the rules and ethics of, of warfare. In fact, uh, um, Imam Malik was of the opinion that, you know, there, there's a discussion uh, amongst the scholars of fiqh that, okay, you're not allowed to kill a woman in, in warfare, right? But what if that woman is a commander or what if that woman is, is a military personnel and, and she is going to shoot you if you don't shoot her? Um, then the ulama, they, the Hanafi scholars, they say, well, you can engage in warfare with her, okay? But the Maliki... Imam Malik was so concerned that the Prophet ﷺ said that do not kill a woman on the battlefield. He said even if a woman, a military personnel was to kill you in the battlefield, right, was to come and kill you in the battlefield both by dint of her being a woman, you run away from her. Okay, because the Prophet ﷺ said you're not allowed to kill a woman. You run away from her because you might kill her and you might go against the hadith. Okay, the other point that uh, I would like to mention is that Again, this is no way justification for anybody to go and do jihad, okay? Um, this is me talking th from a historical point of view. This is a lesson in history. If, if you want to situate this in any discipline, today's lecture is a lesson in history, okay? What I will be talking about is the justification for jihad. Now, those of you who are ulama and students of knowledge, you will find that the rules, the masail of jihad, comes in the books of fiqh under a, a, a category of laws called fiqh al-mu'amalat, okay, civil transactions. So we have fiqh al-ibadat, right, uh, religious transactions such as prayer, fasting, hajj, and all the religious rituals, ibadat, okay, and then we, ha we have civil laws, fiqh al-mu'amalat. This comes under civil law. What that basically means is that where we don't mess around with the ibadat, okay? If you pray like this, or if you pray when you like this, it doesn't matter. What, what matters is you need to pray, okay? But when it comes to uh, civil uh, transactions, then depending on context and things like that, that can, uh, um, that can change. The other thing is that if we look in the books of fiqh, 
then we will find very rarely the ulama actually giving a justification for why jihad needs to be fought against the uh, non-believers. Very rarely in the books of fiqh we will find a justification for why jihad needs to be fought against the non-believers. And there's a sim there's, there is a simple reason why that is. And the reason why that is, was, is because fighting warfare um, fighting warfare jihad was a part and parcel of their life. It was a part of their life. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you must have watched Ertugul, right? They're always fighting. It's a part and parcel of their life. Peace wasn't the norm. Fighting was the norm. And that's why the fiqh books, they go straight into how you deal with non-Muslims, non, uh, uh, what do you do with non-Muslims, um, you know, if, you know, like, so for example, the, the, the issues are so minute, what happens if someone is on the battlefield and his non-Muslim father comes in front of him? Should he kill him or should he not? Okay, because one is a non-Muslim, he's in the battlefield, you're a Muslim, he's a kafir, you're fighting against him, but again, he's your father. So there are two ethics here which are contradicting. What do you do? So they are minute as that. I have a student in, in, um, in Cardiff called Matthew. He's Maliki. And I said to him, Matthew, if you ever go um, to jihad against your parents, then um, you are not allowed, or at least the Hanafi scholars say that you are not allowed to engage with them. You are not allowed to kill them on the battlefield. He goes, thank you, Sheikh. I feel much better. I said, yeah, but the Hanafi ulama say you need to tie your parents up and leave them so somebody else can come and kill them. Okay, so what I'm basically saying is that the, the rules of engagement is so detailed in the books of fiqh, you'll hardly find any justification for why jihad needs to be fought. That kind of justification comes from a different genre. You, you find that in the tafsir literature. You find, find that in the books on political philosophy written by uh, our ulama. Okay, in the fiqh, book, books of fiqh, it directly goes into the rules of engagement. And the reason why is because that was the world view. In the modern age, this is more, the justification for why jihad needs to be fought is something which is more uh, kind of discussed. And the reason why is because no longer Muslims are superpowers. 1898 uh, um, was, the, was the date from which Muslims started spiraling down. That's the date when Napoleon Bonaparte came and invaded Egypt. And after that, Muslim power has been spiraling, spiraling down. Okay, so no longer Muslims are the superpower. And on top of that, we living in the West, the world has become global. We are continuously asked, okay, why is there violence in the Quran? Why is the jihad in the Quran? We have to come up with elaborate answers to that. And therefore, the, the discussion on the justification for why jihad must be fought is, if not a modern concept, the ulama did discuss it in the, in the, in the past, but it's being discussed more uh, today because of our interaction with non-Muslims. And, and this is where I will uh, kind of uh, focus my discussion today. Related to that is blasphemy laws. Okay, and apostasy laws, those we will not discuss today. If anybody wants to ask me, then they can. In there also comes political dissidents. So for example, what is happening in the Arab world? And um, so for example, we find that um, in, in um, uh, Syria, uh, when the first problems happened, there were ulama who actually did not support the dissidents. There were ulama who did not support the people who were against the Assad regime. And they basically uh, stood by the Assad regime. And they gave fatwas that it is haram uh, to go against the Assad regime. Eminent scholars such as Sheikh Muhammad Saeed Ramadan al-Buti, rahimahullah, actually gave fatwa that it is haram to against the Assad regime. That is not because they were bought by the, uh, by, by the regime, but because of their understanding of fiqh. Okay, but we're not going to go into that um, today. When we're talking about the justification of jihad, now we have to understand that in and of itself, there is nothing Islamic about killing another human being. There's nothing Islamic about that. 
There is nothing Islamic about shedding blood. There is nothing Islamic about cutting people's hands off hudud and you know, killing people. There is nothing. There has to be a wise purpose okay, behind that. If there is no wise purpose, then in, it's, it's indiscriminate killing. It cannot be sanctioned by the religion. Now, when we talk about jihad, then as justification of jihad, then there are a few things which are intimately related to that justification of jihad. Number one is to understand the nature of the medieval world. Not even the nature of the medieval world, the nature of late antiquity. That's when Rasulullah came. How was the world like? How did people used to conceptualize the world? Related to that, then we go on to the rationale for jihad. Why is jihad fought? And then related to that is that if you have to fight jihad and get rid of kufr and everybody has to become Muslim, then can we ever have a meaningful relationship with non-Muslims? Yeah? Can we ever have a meaningful relationship with non-Muslims? And then we have um, that's related to division of the world. How, do we, how are we supposed to see the world? Now, do you, do you, do you feel that um, just because we are Muslims that we actually look down upon other people? Do you, I'm asking you a question. Do you feel that we have a superiority complex? No? Do you feel that in our mind somewhere it plays about? Yeah? Yeah? But we're very easy to say those are kuffar, right? To a certain extent, it actually does have a, um, uh, have, have a uh, kind of an effect, okay? Um, I, I remember, and now listen, uh, we're talking about context, right? Take this into context. I'm going to divulge a bit of information about myself. Okay, take this into context. Many, many years ago, um, uh, when I was a young lad, I went to um, um, Blackpool with one of my friends, and somebody tried to sell us some stolen goods. It was a laptop and some cameras, and we knew they were stolen goods, and we um, said, okay, because it was very cheap. Um, and so we went to the bank, took some money out, gave it to the guy. He gave us the bag. The bag. We were very happy with our very lucrative sale. We went to the promenade, opened it, and uh, we found that there were three bottles of lemonade in there. Do you remember Quicksave? Quicksave, our no-frills lemonade was three, four pence each, right? There were three bottles of um, lemonade in there. So I basically said, oh, these guys are really nice. They gave us some lemonade until we realized that we've been done and they've swapped the bugs, right? Um, and my friend got really angry. He said, F and B, they didn't even give us Coke, right? <laughs> so afterwards, he said something which really stuck in my mind. And he said, it's okay. The car fears they're going to burn in the fire of hell anyway. Now, that was very profound for me at that time. It really stuck with me um, because here we are in our full sanity, know that we are committing a crime in the religion, but also commit a, committing a crime in the law. And then we have the audacity and the moral superiority to say that their calf is they're going to burn in the fire of hell, we Muslims will be fine. So that kind of um, attitude, the superiority complex, actually does have an effect on the way that we, how we treat others to the extent to the extent that people can go and blow up other people, right? That's the point that I'm trying to make, right? So these are the four points that I will go through, um, inshallah, if time permits. Um, so now let's look at the first one, which is the nature of the medieval world. Now, if we look at the nature of the medieval world, uh, geographically, then we find that the medieval world, or, or this, is, this is not the medieval, the late antiquity, 700, was a world where there was no such thing as nation state. Yeah, nation state is a very modern concept. You know, started with European imperialism, where uh, Austria and Hungary Empire and the German Empire, the British Empire, and then everything breaks up and becomes England, Germany, Hungary, Austria, um, Bangladesh, Pakistan, India. Uh, before all of that, right? It was, you'll have the Umayyad dynasty, you'll have the Chinese dynasty, you have the, you know, the, 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 the Turkic dynasty, you'll have the Western Roman Empire, you'll have the Eastern Roman Empire, then you'll have the Habasha here. That, that was the, uh, um, during the medieval period, but even during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi that's how it was. During the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi we had the Eastern Roman Empire known as the Byzantine, 
right? Massive land. Then we had all the way up to Alexandria and north of, north of uh, Najd, Saudi Arabia. Then we had uh, what we call the Persian Empire, okay? And then here in Africa, the, the Habashite Empire. So the point I'm trying to make is there was no such thing as nation state borderlines. These were vast amount of lands that we were talking about. Vast, vast amount of lands that we were talking about. That's the, that's the first reality, okay? That during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, we were not dealing with nation states, we were dealing with empires and borders were vast. As far as geography is concerned, how about relationship with a different empire? What was the relationship with a different empire? The state of the world in late antiquity, late antiquity is a time in history where the Prophet ﷺ came. Okay. Um, the whole world was in a state of war. Okay. Uh, here we have Jonathan Fletcher as a historian, violence and civilization. Individual lords had to engage in war to save themselves and their families. If they did not, then sooner or later, they would be overtaken by another lord and have to be submit to his rule or be killed, right? Those of you who watch Ertugul, think. You either kill or you be killed. You either conquer or you be conquered. And that was the nature of the world when the Prophet ﷺ came. The default status in the world was a status of war, not a status of peace. If you needed peace, what did you need? What do you need if you needed peace? A peace treaty, okay? And there was an old Arab custom, tradition of peace treaty for four months where the Arabs made, this is not an Islamic ruling, this is before the Prophet ﷺ, for four months, the Arabs made a rule that during those four months, we will allow people to um, come to Hajj, do, come to the sacred places, do their rituals, and nobody will touch them. And in anybody touch those people, then that was seen as a violation of the laws of old Arabia. That law was maintained in the Quran. This is called the Ashhurul Hurm. Right? We see in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this. Uh, when the sacred months are past, kill the idolaters, mushrikun, wherever you find them and seize them besiege them and, light, uh, and lie in wait for them in every place of ambush. But if they repent, pray regularly and give the alms tax, then let them go their way, for God is forgiving, merciful. If anybody wants to know the translation that I've used is Oxford translation by Professor Abdul Halim. Okay, that's the translation that I'm using. So here we have a situation where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the sacred months. In those sacred months, Muslims are not allowed to violate those sacred months. That was a peace treaty. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that as soon as the sacred months are over, then go and start your war again. Now this is uh, an ayat of Surah Toba, and it is directly related to combat. The Muslims were directly in combat and warfare with the mushrikun of Mecca. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them that do not violate the Ashurul Hurum. And the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them the Muslims do not violate the four sacred months is because the four sacred months was something which was not initiated by Islam. It was initiated before Islam came. And the Sahaba, they might have thought, and the Prophet might have thought that, yeah, because this was an Arab custom, we as Muslims do not need to follow that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, he reveals that even Muslims need to honor this and therefore during the sacred months do not kill after that you're in a state of war you you go and fight now that's the context this context uh, tommy robinson and others and also the mujahidun terrorists extremists they take this and they say look kill them besiege them ambush them this is known as the ayah to safe the sword verse okay the infamous sword verse verse but it's telling Muslims to lay in ambush. But if you actually read this verse and read the verses before it and after it, then you'll see that it's talking about a particular war situation and it's not talking about a situation where there is peace. Okay, the point that I'm trying to make in all of this is that the civilization and the relationship between uh, um, 
empires, I'm not talking about Muslims and non-Muslims, I'm talking about empires. The relationship between empires and people is one of war and not one of peace. You either conquer or you be conquered. You either kill or you be killed. I mean, the Arabs had internal tribal wars. For a thousand years, they used to have, you know, Bu'ath, internal tribal wars. So all of this needs to be put into con context. In that context, what we basically see, in that context, we understand that there are two types of jihad, two types of qital. Okay? In, in the Quran, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to express armed violence, okay, then he uses the word qital because jihad can mean both struggle or armed violence. There are two types of jihad, military struggle, jihad as defensive war or jihad as offensive war. In the books of fiqh, and I know I said that I'm not going to go into fiqh, but I have to go into it a bit. In the books of fiqh, offensive war is seen as fard kifaya. Can someone tell me what fard kifaya is? Fard kifaya? It's a communal obligation. If some people do it, then it's okay for the rest of the people. As far as uh, defensive war is concerned, when the enemy is attacking the Muslims, it becomes for the ayn for everyone to support and defend themselves. So these are the two types of um, jihad. Now, let's look at offensive war because a lot of the time people really do not have a problem with defensive war. Yeah. People do not actually have a problem with defensive warfare because, you know, you're gonna, somebody's going to attack you, then you'll have to defend them. If somebody wants to come into my house to attack me, then I'll have to defend. I'll probably walk in one. I don't think, you know, reasonably, I don't think the law will find me guilty in doing that on my property. So nobody actually has a problem with defensive war. Um, it's mainly the offensive war. Um, defensive war, let's talk about defensive war. Defensive war is basically what we can talk, or, uh, what we call military conscription. Now, if you were to understand the way that I explained to the MOD, uh, the armed forces, how they, uh, how you want to conceptualize jihad, is think of the armed forces. Yeah, the armed forces, the Ministry of uh, of Defense. There are a certain number of people who have joined the army, and their job is to basically defend. UK. Think of the Mujahideen. Now, not all of the Sahabi used to go to do jihad. Okay, some were left behind. Some were ulama. Others were, you know, others were blind. Others were. Uh, so, not all of them went. Think of them as going to the borders as military conscription, and that's why we find in the Hadith the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that praying on the uh, on the Rabat. Rabat is the borders. That the border of the so during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Muta, uh, the Ghazwai Muta, Muta was on the border with the Eastern Byzantine Empire. Okay, so going on the borders and and protecting the borders, right? That was jihad. So it is military conscription. When I went to Seattle a few years back, um, went to the beach and I saw there was an army barrack there, and there was uh, missiles. There were missiles there pointing towards the Pacific Ocean, right? And there's nothing there in the Pacific Ocean. So I asked my uh, uh, tour guide that, why is there missiles pointing towards the Pacific Ocean? And they said, the missile is pointing towards the Pacific Ocean in case there is an imminent threat from Japan. Now think geography, right? Japan is on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, but that is defensive warfare. Okay, so think of the, the, the state of war was the default case and the, the, the Sahaba, the companions always had to be on the lookout because either it's they get attacked or they get attacked or they attack. So even offensive warfare, offensive warfare was also a form of defense because if you do not attack first, you'll be attacked. And that's how it was seen during the time of the Prophet ﷺ. It was because of the nature of the world. It was because of the nature of the world. Now, there is only one. Uh, uh, um, this then leads us to the question. This le then leads us to the question that jihad with non-Muslims. Yeah. 
I, I, I will go, go to that question, but let's look at um, some of the verses of the Quran. I'll answer that question later on. Verses from the Quran, we see the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the beginning life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Mecca, it was non-confrontation. Okay? We find in the Quran, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, فَاسْتَعْ بِمَا تُؤْمَرْ وَأَعْرِضْ عَنِ الْمُشْرِكِينَ Profess openly what you have been commanded and turn away from the mushrikun for we are sufficient for you against the scoffers. Sabr. Okay? Don't listen to them, just do your stuff. Non-confrontation. It was only when we go to Medina in the second year of Hijrah, we find that permission has been given. أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا Permission is given to those who fight. Why? Because they have been wronged. Not because the others are kuffar, non-Muslims, but because they have been madhlum, ظُلِمُوا The raisin detra, the justification for jihad and fighting is in this verse. Those who have been unjustly expelled from their homes only because they say, our Lord is Allah. That is talking about religious persecution. Yeah, it is talking about religious persecution that because they were religiously persecuted and because they have been Muslim, they have been wronged, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the Muslims the, uh, the permission to go and defend themselves. So then what is the raison d'etre? What is the justification for jihad as understood by these verses of the Quran? Preserving the physical integrity of the Muslims. How do you preserve the physical integrity of the Muslims? By protecting the borders of the vast empires. Because remember Islam is not only a religion, Islam is also a state. Preserving the physical integrity of the Muslims and by preserving the physical integrity of the Muslims, peace. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran Surah Al-Anfal, prepare whatever forces you believers can muster, including war horse to frighten off God's enemies and yours and one others unknown to you, but known to God. Whatever you give in God's cause will be repaid to you in full and you will not be wronged. Then Allah says, but if they incline towards peace, you must also incline towards it and put your trust in Allah. So we have to understand from this that killing is not indiscriminate. There is a relation here. If the enemy attacks you, attack. If the enemy puts down their, uh, if the enemy puts down their weapons, then فَإِنْ جَنَحُ salam, Then you also have to do that. This is from the Quran. So the reason Dr. behind jihad is preserving the physical integrity of the Muslims. Then the question is, is it then holy war? Is jihad then holy war? My answer to that is no. Because there, isn't, there is a concept of holy in the Quran, in Islam, Al-Muqaddas, such as Baytul Muqaddas, Jerusalem. There is a, uh, there is a um, concept of Al-Harb, war in Islam, but there isn't a concept of Al-Harb Al-Muqaddas, a holy war, that's a Christian concept. So then why is there war then? The reason why there is war is because fear of non-Muslim empires was the only fear Muslims had. Think about the context that I developed. Empires attacking, imminent attack, imminent threat. That imminent threat was always there, right? And therefore the fear of non-Muslim empires was the only fear that Muslims had. Hence, non-Muslims and hostile forces were blurred boundaries, okay? Non-Muslim living in a non-Muslim place, Okay, where there is a there is a fear of imminent imminent threat, right? So then non-Muslims, kafirs, and enemies, it becomes a blurred boundary. Because we also do find that within the Islamic provinces, there were non-Muslims living. These were called Ahlul Dhimma, protected minority. Nobody was allowed to go and kill them. Yeah? Nobody was allowed to in fact if some if a Muslim killed them, then there would have been qisas on them. So now the question is, then jihad, as understood here, should jihad be fought because of kufr? Because the non-Muslims are kuffar kafirs and therefore they should be fought because of their kufr? Or should jihad be fought because they are hostile forces, because they are enemies? Majority of the ulama are of the opinion 
that jihad is only fought because the non-Muslim is hostile, meaning that they are imminently, allow, uh, imminently about to attack. Okay? If they are not about to attack, if they are with peace treaty with the Muslims, then the ulama and the fuqaha, they say that it is haram to attack. So jihad is to be fought not because of their kufr, but because of their being hostile forces. Now, there is only one group amongst the, uh, um, the classical Muslim scholars, which is the Shafi'i school of uh, uh, thought. They were of the opinion that non-Muslims should be fought because of their kufr. Their kufr is enough for them to basically get killed and brought under the, um, the, uh, uh, the banner and the flag of Islam. That was, the, that was the opinion of Imam Shafi'i and the Shafi'i school of thought. Jihad is to be fought because of unbelief and to uphold Muslim power. Abu Ishaq Shirazi, who was a Muslim Shafi'i scholar, says Muslims should wage war against non-Muslims at least once a year. This is so because failing to wage war for more than a year will cause the enemy to transgress against non-Muslims. I mean, think of that again, empire, imminent attack. And they're basically saying, look, if you don't attack them for a year, they're going to think that the Muslims have gone weak and let's attack them. So always keeping that, you know, tension on the edge. Even that, although it's offensive warfare, even that has to be understood in light of that context that I developed. We also find that uh, the Hanafi scholars also discuss about this. Imam Kasani discusses this. But the Hanafi ulama, are basically, they basically say, well, Muslims actually do not actually need to go into warfare. What they basically need to do is they need to, ex uh, they need to basically um, put their might on uh, exhibition. So they need to build big forts, they need to have missiles, they need to have weapons and put them on the border so that the enemy can see. It's, it's a bit like nowadays uh, countries are vying to be nuclear states. Uh, nobody messes with a nuclear state, right? Uh, when, when, the, when the fallout between uh, Russia and um, you know, the UK happened a few months ago over the, uh, over the poison. Uh, one of the things that Russians sa uh, Russia said to Britain is you don't mess around with a nuclear state. That's actually a, a, a statement of power. Okay? Um, the Hanifi scholars say that you don't actually need to go into active warfare. All you need to do is you need to exhibit uh, uh, the power. But again, this is all how they conceptualized it. Even, even in, in the Shafi'i school of law, uh, as we understand from Abu Isaac al-Shirazi, that this offensive is because if you don't do that, then they will attack you. So keeping them on their toes. But the majority of the ulama are of the opinion that jihad is to be fought because the non-Muslims are hostile forces. How long do I have, Mulana? Okay. Um, this then goes, uh, takes us to talk about a uh, relationship with non-Muslims in scripture. Okay, so if jihad, uh, as I have established, from the majority of the scholars, they basically say that jihad is to be fought because of uh, hostile forces, then what, is, what should be Muslims' uh, uh, relationship with non-Muslims? We find that in the Quran, depending on the historical situation, we find that sometimes the Quran, the Quran is actually quite um, uh, not very uh, accommodating of the Jews. And when we talk about the Jews in Surah Al-Hashr, we talk about the Jews of Medina. Okay? Um, from there, you cannot actually extrapolate and say that uh, the Quran justifies uh, you know, or some of the things that is happening uh, and the bombings and all of that. Um, in, you know, against the Israelis. Um, although there are other reasons why that can be justified, but you cannot extrapolate that from the Quran. Okay, there is no way that the Quran will actually uh, you can do that. Um, the relationship with the Jews um, and the hostile relationship with the Jews in the Quran was the Jews of the Bani Nazir, the Banu Qaynuqa, and the Bani Qurayza of Medina, and how they were always trying to shaft. Uh, that's a colloquial word, how they were always trying to uh, basically stab the Muslims in the back and uh, uh, conspiracy and treachery. And that's why the Quran does not really talk to them in, about them in palatable terms. But when we look at how the Quran talks about Christians, it says that the Christians are the closest to the Muslims. Okay? So, so it depends on the situation, but there is a default status in the Quran of, of um, how we deal with 
um, Muslim, um, people of the world reminds me of a lecture by Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala who uh, written to one of his commanders Ashtar when he was uh, um, conquering some of the places of Iraq and he basically said uh, you will come across two types of people this, this uh, saying is in the Nahjul Balagha uh, for the ulama you will come across two types of people one of those people are those who are your brothers in your religion and the other type of people are who are your cousins in humanity. Yeah? Sinfun ikhwanuk fi dinik wa khalqun a'ilatuk fil khalq. Right? Sinfun a'ilatuk fil khalq. There is uh, one group who is your brother in religion and the other group is your cousin or your family in humanity. Okay? And that is the default status that we find uh, from the Quran. The, the Quran talks about the sacredness of humanity. The sacredness of وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ That we have made the Bani Adam uh, uh, um, sacred. We have honored the Bani Adam, the, the human being. Not the Muslims only, but the human being. Okay? And that also comes in organ donation and everything. We're not going to go into that. Okay? Also, the Quran says marriage with Ahlul Kitab. Ahlul, uh, Muslim men are allowed to marry um, Ahlul Kitab women. Um, why on earth would you marry somebody if you, if you have to kill them? Unless you think that marriage is something where you fight over until death. But that's, that's a different thing. But in the Quran, we find that the Quran allows marriage with Ahlul Kitab. The Quran also allows eating the, uh, uh, the food of the Ahlul Kitab. Kosher meat. And if a Christian um, who, who slaughters in the name of Allah, then it's permissible to eat that. Now, if it was said that no, you can't have any relationship, then they would be very you, you would be very suspicious of eating the meat of non-Muslims because they might poison you, or you might poison them. Um, also, relationship with non-combatants. Uh, we found the relationship with non-combatants, and you're not, you're not even on the jihad field. Muslims are not allowed to kill them. So, <coughs> so we find that uh, relationship with non-Muslims in Scripture as a default status is the sacredness of humanity. Right? We find in the Quran, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala also says this. In, uh, in, in, in Surah Al-Mumtahina لَا يَنْهَاكُمُ اللَّهُ عَنِ الَّذِينَ لَمْ يُقَاتِلُكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ وَلَمْ يُخْرُجُكُمْ مِنْ دِيَارِكُمْ أَنْ تَبَرُ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forbid you to deal kindly and justly with anyone who has not fought you for your faith or driven you out of your homes. God loves the just. But God forbids you to take as allies those who have fought against you for your faith, driven you out of your homes and helped others to drive you out. Any of you who takes them as allies will truly be wrongdoers. That's a very common sense approach, right? You make friends with people who are nice to you. Uh, why would you make friends with people who are nasty to you? Be they Muslim or non-Muslim. You know, we all know neighbors from hell. Some of our neighbors are Muslims, right? But if people are nasty to you, why would you be nice to them? Okay, not necessarily nasty, but why would you be friends with them? So this is a very common sense approach. That Allah SWT says, look, this is the relationship. If people don't hurt, harm you, they don't drive you, drive you out, there's no religious persecution involved, then there's nothing wrong with ha having good relationship with them. But if they do fight you, then you can't have relationship, you can't take them as allies. Ummah of Medina, constitution of Medina, I'm not going to look at that. Maybe afterwards, citizens of the Islamic State. Um, I have many slides left. So um, the Quranic division, so the Quranic division, we always hear Darul Islam, Darul Kufr, yeah? This is the, uh, the, the abode of Islam and this is the abode of Kufr. We've heard those terminologies, Darul Islam, Darul Kufr. How are we to understand those? Because the, our ulama also did use the terms Darul Islam, Darul Kufr. They did use those, the land of Islam and the land of Kufr. How do we read those? Are we to understand Darul Islam and Darul Kufr as something which is sanctioned by the Quran and therefore it doesn't matter what happens until kingdom comes, until Qiyamah, we will have to maintain this dichotomy and we will always have to have a Muslim land and that Muslim land will always have to be opposed to a non-Muslim land. I've already established that it's not because of the Kufr that one fights jihad, it's because of hostile forces. Okay, number one. Point number two is that this division of Muslims and non-Muslims or Muslim land and non-Muslim land is the reality, the ground reality that the Prophet ﷺ found himself in. It is the ground reality that the Sahaba found themselves in. It is the ground reality that the, uh, that the Tabi'u, the Tabi'u, the Tabi'een and the Ulama, they found themselves in. 
that this is how, the, I mean, this is, if you know your crusade history, if you know your crusade history, then you'll know that anybody other than Christians were known as the Saracens and the infidels. So for them, we were Darul Kufr. That's how the whole world was, the whole world citizenship in a world at that time was based on religion. Not based on nationhood state, and this is why I made the empires, and citizenship was based on nation, uh, nation state. And not on, on uh, sorry, based on religion and not on nation state. Today somebody can say that I'm, I'm a Brit, I'm fighting for Britain, or I'm a Bengali, I'm fighting for my country. But imagine in 1066, if Pope Urban II basically gave a call and said, come all of you, let's, you know, we need to go and free the Holy Land so that you know, the coffers of France can be full. Nobody will listen to him. But he said, we need to go and save the Holy Lands so that uh, um, the Christ and Christianity can rise again against the Saracens and against the infidels. Everybody, everybody jumped up and they were ready because citizenship... The language of citizenship was religion in those days. The nation state came and changed that, and now it's Bengalis, Pakistanis, Indians, um, Welsh against the English, right? It's a completely different. So this whole idea of Darul Islam, Darul Harb, dominion of war and dominion of peace is, is a description. It's not a religious mandate. It's not a religious prescription. It is a description of how the Prophet Wasallam and his companions found themselves in. And there is nothing wrong with if that reality is not there anymore. And that reality is not there anymore. So let's look at some of the opinions of what is an abode of Islam. Okay, the fuqaha, the ulama, they have discussed this. What is an abode of Islam? Number one is... When we basically talk about an abode of Islam, the land of Islam, there isn't a consensus amongst the ulama as to what constitutes a land of Islam. The first one, which is the most obvious one, everyone understands, is where there is Sharia law. Okay, uh, according to Imam Abu Hanifa, that the, the, the executive body and the government have to be Muslim. Some form of Sharia law has to be applied and Muslims are safe as far as their religion is concerned and their wealth and body is concerned. If those three conditions are found, then that uh, we can say that that is an abode of Islam. There is a second opinion which basically says that the, as long as the government is, is Muslim, okay, irrelevant of whether the government applies Islam or not, that is known as an Islamic country. A prime example of that will be Bangladesh, which is a, which is a secular country. The law is a secular law, but the government is uh, um, is um, Muslim. The third opinion will be where the majority population is Muslim. Okay? But the majority population is, uh, is Muslim. So even if we have a country where the hukam, the government is not Muslim, but the majority of the people are, are Muslim, then that will be counted as a, 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 a land of Islam. And then the fourth one is uh, a place where Muslims are able to practice their religion without persecution where there is religious freedom, according to this opinion, even UK can also be classed as a land of Islam. Certainly CLC can be uh, classed as a part of land of Islam because there is no religious persecution. And I'm not making this up. This is, this is from, the, from the fifth literature. The point that I'm trying to make is that even when we talk about Darul Islam and Darul Harb, and what constitutes Darul Islam and what constitutes Darul Harb and can a Darul Islam change into Darul Harb or can a Darul Harb change into Darul Islam? It's not a black and white discussion. There is, there is a lot of details on this. Okay? Imam Abu Hanifa is of the opinion that it is very, very, very difficult for, uh, uh, it's impossible for Darul Islam uh, to actually revert back to Darul Harb, Darul Kufr. So according to Imam Abu Hanifa, even today Andalusia, Spain is still Darul Islam. And it is the duty of the Muslims to win it and bring back Islamic law. So what I'm basically saying is that it is a complex discussion amongst the ulama. And it's not something that, oh, we're living in uh, the land of Kufur and we're living in, you know, I studied in Egypt for, for two years. And I saw the kind of, uh, you know, the, um, the, the amount of things that you can do and you can't do as far as religion is concerned. Um, you can ask Mufti Shafiq for the details. Okay. Shashni. Um, 30. <laughs> now, let me just, let me just um, explain one, one slide here. We all know the name of Ibn Taymiyyah. Yeah, you've heard Ibn Taymiyyah? 
Ibn Taymiyyah um, in the 9-11 uh, report that was commissioned after 9-11, he was basically named as the fountainhead of modern Islamism. Ibn Taymiyyah was a radical scholar. Uh, he didn't get along with a lot of his... Um, he is also... Ibn Taymiyyah is also kind of the intellectual figurehead of today's Wahhabis and Salafis. Saudi Arabia, they love him. Um, but Ibn Taymiyyah was a lot more than what they make him. Um, he, he was a scholar who was um, uh, uh, radical in the sense that he wouldn't. He 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 will always go against the grain, and he will talk his mind. Okay. Now Ibn Taymiyyah uh, lived through the Mongol onslaught in 1258 when Mongols sacked uh, uh, um, uh, Baghdad. He he lived through that. You know, the, it was it was quite uh, quite a long excursion, and. Um, there was a place, Ibn Taymiyyah originally came from a place in the, in the, in the far um, eastern uh, borders of Turkey called Harran, and near there there is a place called Mardin, okay? Um, and in that Mardin, in that place Mardin, the Mongols came over and they took over Mardin. The majority of the population of Mardin uh, were Muslims. The Mongols came over and they took, they took that and they were non-Muslims. So a fatwa was asked of Ibn Taymiyyah that because the government is no longer uh, Muslim, should we do hijrah, migrate from Mardin and go to a place where there is, uh, um, uproot ourselves and go to a place where there is uh, um, Muslim rule? Or can we stay here? Because the Mongols, although they've taken uh, uh, taken over, but they're not actually killing us, they're not harming us. So, so is it Darul Islam? Is it Darul Kuf? Ibn Taymiyyah basically gave a fatwa which became known as Al Fatawa Al Mardiniyyah, or the famous Mardin fatwa. Um, he basically said, Mardin is not a Darul Islam because there's, there's no longer Muslim rule, but it's not a Darul Kuf because the majority of the people are still Muslims and therefore it's not. So what is it? He comes up with the third classification and he says that it is Darul Amn. It is an abode of peace. Yeah? And this is the first time we find that a third category is interjected into the Islamic fiqh, fiqh, uh, fiqh literature, which is the abode of peace. Is this a dominion of war in the UK? Is it a dominion of... Um, there are some people here that don't actually pray the Jummah prayer in the UK. Um, if they do pray the Jummah prayer, they will go back home and do four rakat Zuhur prayer because they don't believe this to be an Islamic country and, an, and for Jummah to be uh, sahih, you need the Sultan to be leading the prayer. There are people actually here in the UK, in Oldham, who go back home and pray four rakats because they don't believe this to be a Muslim country. Okay? Um, because they don't believe that uh, this is a Kafir country and there is no Jummah in, uh, in a Kafir country. But that's a by and by. Okay? Don't go and practice that. Um, so, what's very interesting is, what is very interesting is that this is the, the Mardin Fatwa. The Mardin Fatwa is the same Fatwa that was used by Abdul Salam Ibn Al Faraj. Does anybody know the name Abdul Salam Ibn Al Faraj? Abdul Salam Ibn Al Faraj was the mastermind behind the assassination of Anwar Sadat in 1981 in Egypt. The Mardin Fatwa was the basis from which Abdul Salam ibn al-Faraj found the justification to go and kill Anwar Sadat, declaring Anwar Sadat to be a kafir and kill him, killing him. Back in uh, 2006, there was another conference held in Mardin, back in 2006, um, headed by Sheikh Abdullah bin Baya, and they wanted to basically have a uh, new look at the Mardin Fatwa. Okay, look at different manuscripts. Um, because, and then Sheikh Abdullah bin Baya, he, he's a grammarian, he's an Arabist, he basically said, if you can see here, there's no, there's no dots, there's no dots here. Old Arabic doesn't have dots. There are only 17 letters of the Arabic al alphabet, if you take all the dots away. Right? Here, Ibn Taymiyyah says, as for Muslims, you will deal with them in the proper way. As for the non-Muslims, this, this word here can be read 
can, can be read, read it, that's not even English, is it? Can be read two ways, yuqatil or yu'amil. The way that the modern editor of the manuscript edited this and which was read by Abdul Salam ibn Faraj was, as for non Muslims, yuqatil, you fight them and kill them. Okay? And that was the basis on which Abdul Salam ibn Faraj based his fatwa to kill Anwar Sadat, who he believed was not a Muslim. But Sheikh bin Baya went through this, he was, he was an Arabist, went through a lot of the um, different manuscripts and he, he basically then declared that Yuqatim is an editorial error. The editor wasn't very proficient in the Arabic language and he assumed that this is Yuqatil but actually the word should be Yu'amil. Okay? As for the non-Muslims, you do Mu'amala of them the way that they would do mu'amala with you. That completely changes the entire meaning. The point in all of that is the whole ideology of violent extremism was based on a misreading of a single word. Okay, my um, uh, slide here, extremist versus extremist, I've got about 15 slides here, um, which I'm not gonna go through, is looking at the history of the Gama Islamia. This is the point where uh, an Islambuli he shoots in 19, uh, Anwar Sadat in 1981. In 1997, after these guys were tortured in prison, they came up with a statement and they read in front of the national media and they said that we have done Toba from our past actions. This is the Gama Islamia. We have done Toba from our past actions and we have come to the understanding that all the violent killings that we have done, so the, in 1997 they did the Luxor massacre, they killed uh, professionals, they killed non-Muslims, they killed you know, other political dissidents, and they said that we have found that Islamically this is wrong, we do Toba for this, and we have washed our hands from violent extremism. Okay? And it, it wasn't a tactical move. Somebody might say that because they were uh, Karam Muhammad Zuhdi was still alive. It wasn't a tactical move on their on the behalf just to come out of prison. It was a doctrinal shift. And one of the reasons why the doctrinal shift happened was because they got access to ulama. These guys, Gama Islamiyah, they're actually ed self-educated. They read the Quran, they read all the books, self-educated. But they got access to ulama who were also in prison, who, and they had 25 years, they were in prison. They had 25 years to think about their actions read the Qur'an, read Tafsir, read the rules of Jihad, and at the end they did Toba. And um, they basically started an initiative called Mubadarat Waqful Unf, the initiative to stop the violence. They wrote four books, uh, four books addressed to Osama bin Laden, telling them where they were wrong and advising Osama bin Laden that what you are doing is also wrong, you should stop. This is why I call it extremist versus extremist. I don't have time to go into it, it's a very interesting uh, discussion, the whole history of the Gama Islamia, but maybe some other time, inshallah. I call the public, I'll stop for the law, I'll be with the Muslim. I'll stop for the law, I'll be with the Muslim.